Uh, welcome to Medicine in Our Backyard. This is a series that's presented by the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. I am Adrian Windsor. I'm on the board of the board of directors of the foundation, and we are happy to welcome you here tonight. So uh, I want to first thank Mike and Polly Smith for their generous support. Mike, would you please stand? I Mike and Polly not only continue to support this, they are really the initiators. And this whole wonderful series that we have in conjunction with UCI is in great part because of their inspiration. And we do this in conjunction with UCI Health, and they support this as well. So we are very fortunate. Now, a little bit about the foundation. How many of you are members? A few. Well, let's see if we can increase that number. Uh, the foundation supports things for the library that the city does not support. And many of them are silent and you wouldn't see them uh, at lynda.com, for instance, ebooks, we support all of that. The media center, the seats you're sitting on, all of those have been gifts from the foundation. We have two lecture series, the Woody series and Library Live. And if you're a member of the foundation, you get our bookmark and you know all about these events early on. So I hope, hope if you're not a member, you'll consider becoming one. So tonight, let me introduce our two wonderful speakers. And let me say first, if you haven't silenced your cell phones, please do it now. Oh, <laughs> even our speakers are, <laughs> are doing that for us. So our first speaker is going to be Dr. Faisal Yafi. He is an assistant professor of urology and andrology and director of men's health at UCI. <laughs> he's, a, he's a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Canada and is currently an active member of the Sexual Medicine Society of North America. That sounds a bit provocative. <laughs> Uh, he, also, the American Society of Andrology and the American Urological Association. Dr. Yaffe earned his medical degree from the American University of Beirut and did interesting inter, and did internship at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and completed his residency in urology at McGill University of Montreal, Quebec. He completed a two-year fellowship in andrology, sexual medicine and prosthetics at Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana. Now he has to leave early tonight, so we're changing the procedure a little bit. After he speaks, we will have 10 minutes of questions, and then we'll go on to our second speaker, Dr. Bruce Mander. Dr. Mander received his PhD in neuroscience at Northwestern University and completed his postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Psychology at Berkeley. His research is concerned with characterizing the role of sleep in cognitive function and overall brain health across the human lifespan in both healthy populations and populations at risk for neurodegenerative diseases. I think both of these fine research scientists and physicians have professions that are becoming more and more vital as we age. <laughs> so I'd like you to join me in welcoming our two speakers for this evening, Dr. Faisal Yaffe and Dr. Bruce Mander, and Dr. Yaffe will be first. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation to the Newport Library for inviting me again. This is the second year I'm invited, so I guess I didn't completely mess up last year, so I'm really happy to be here again. Um, I'll be talking about uh, the UCI Men's Health Program, and this is a program that started about three years ago when I joined UCI, and it's flourished, and you know, I'm, and we're very excited about it. So I'll show you some pictures about what, what our brick-and-mortar uh, center looks like, and I'll discuss a little bit about some of the things we do. 
So this is the, our offices. They're, in the loca they're located very close to here. They're on Birch and Mesa in what's called Newport Heights. So very close to here, new building, uh, very pretty on the outside and, and on the inside. This is the, uh, the lobby of the building downstairs. Um, and the, the, behind those doors is Sleep Center and Behavioral Health. But if you go up the stairs, you end up in urology. This is the lobby of the urology uh, division and the men's health uh, program is up here. This is an example of one of our rooms, nice, big, spacious rooms with a monitor that allows us to demonstrate on the monitor some of the things that we do to our patients. And this is a, an example of a procedure room. So we offer the whole gamut of urological procedures in, in, this, uh, in this office. So we offer procedures for BPH, for sexual dysfunction, vasectomies, uh, female sexual dysfunction, female urology, and other procedures there. So this is who we have working there. So there's 10 of us there, uh, Dr. Clayman, uh, Dr. Landman, Dr. Patel, and Dr. Yacoub are endourologists. Basically means they do kidney stones and any procedure that require a camera that's going up uh, through the, uh, the urinary orifices and they do also kidney surgery. Dr. Choi and Dr. Dina Moskowitz are female urology specialists and pelvic floor specialists as well for avoiding dysfunction. They do urodynamic studies and advanced testing for bladder. Uh, Dr. Ross Moskowitz and Dr. Ronald Solomon are general urologists and they practice the whole gamut of urology. Uh, Dr. Hugen is an oncology fellowship trained urologist who does bladder, kidney, prostate, and testes cancer amongst others. And I'm the men's health specialist there. So you can see it takes 10 of us to, to treat urinary urination but uh, we really cover the whole gamut of urology. So we, we're, we're excited that we have all these fellowship trained physicians there. And we really find that if you have any kind of urological issue, you don't really need to travel outside of Newport anymore. Uh, everything is offered right here in, 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 this, in our backyard. Um, so just looking at men's health per se, so some of the conditions uh, I treat or retreat in men's health include a enlarged prostate, erectile and ejaculatory dysfunction, male infertility, uh, Peyronie's disease, prostate cancer and prostate cancer screening, prostate infections, anything related to the scrotum or the testicles, testosterone deficiency is a big one that we treat, as well as urinary tract infections, urinary incontinence, and varicose leal, which is distension of the veins in the, in the scrotum. Uh, but we also offer a lot of procedures in the clinic. Like I said, we, we do a lot of cystoscopies looking inside the bladder. We do urodynamic testing. Uh, we do vasectomies, vasectomy reversals, infertility surgeries, sperm retrievals. Uh, we do the most advanced imaging and uh, biopsies for prostate cancer. Uh, these are MRI fusion biopsies. We do in-office procedures for BPH, so now you can come into the office, get a procedure for BPH that takes about three minutes to do and you walk out and it gets great outcomes. So a lot of what we do in the operating room has moved into the clinic. Uh, we also do injections for Peyronie's disease, which I'll show you in a little bit. And we're now the most, one of the most advanced uh, centers for prosthetic surgery and neurology in, in probably the west coast of the United States, and I'll show you some of the things that we do. So I'm gonna to touch on a few topics related to men's health and to what I do. Uh, I obviously can't cover everything, but within the, within the framework of what we can, I'll, I'll show you some of the things. So we'll start with BPH, the most common condition that afflicts men. So if you look on the left side of the screen, you'll see a... Is there, is there point of work here? Wonderful, so if you look on the left side of the screen, this is the prostate and this is the bladder. You can see when the prostate is small, the urinary passageway of the urethra that goes through the prostate is pretty patent and the bladder is empty, the bladder wall looks thin and nice. But as the prostate enlarges as a man gets older, it constricts the passageway of the urination. As it constricts that passageway, what happens is the bladder, which is a muscle, starts having to strain and push harder to push the urine out through that small tight passageway. As that happens, the muscle of the bladder, as with the muscle of the heart, if someone has a strenuous or, or have high blood pressure and you have to push with the heart to push that blood out, same thing happens here. The bladder becomes thicker, as you can see here, and it becomes dysfunctional. So it's not able to push the urine out. Eventually, the urine accumulates in the bladder and the person is not able to empty the bladder. So when we look at the statistics for BPH, if you see here, it's an age-related condition. 26% of men in their 40s goes up to 50% of men in their 50s and 60s and jumps up to 90% of men in their 70s and 80s. So as men get older, the prostate gets larger. As the prostate gets larger, they get more problems. So what are the symptoms that we correlate with BPH? So this on the right thing is called the IPSS questionnaire. It's a questionnaire that we give all men who come into the clinic with urination issues. We ask about whether they're able to empty their bladder 
bladder or do they have to go back to urinate within a couple of minutes after peeing? Do they have frequency of urination? Does it, do they have intermittency? It means the urine stops and goes when they're peeing. Do they have to run to the bathroom or do they have time? Uh, is the stream strong or is it just a dribble? Uh, do they have to strain to urinate? Do they have to sit there and push for the urine to come out? And do they have nocturia, which means how many times are they waking up at night to, to, to urinate? And now, as we know, as men get older, the most common reason for fractures, hip and, or fractures and things of the sort in older men is waking up to, to urinate at night. It's dark, there's things on the floor, balance is not great, men is getting up to pee for the third time in the middle of the night, they can fall and hurt themselves. So it's important to address these things. So what are the complications of BPH if you keep it untreated? So if you look here, this is the kidney. Over time, the kidney becomes dysfunctional. Because of not being able to empty the bladder, there's pressure on the kidney, and the kidney becomes dysfunctional. You can end up with renal failure. You can end up with little bladder stones, as you can see here. You can have blood in the urine. Um, you can have recurrent urine infections. Sometimes at the end stage when the bladder is, the prostate is pretty enlarged and the bladder really can't push the urine out. Some men go into urinary retention, which means they can't pee at all and they end up in the emergency room and we have to put a catheter. So there are ways to either prevent this or treat this early on where, you know, men don't have to end up in the emergency room with these complications. So how do we work up someone with BPH? First, we take a thorough history because we want to know whether the problem is related to the prostate as a blockage problem or the problem is related to the bladder where the bladder is not functioning properly or it's a combination of both things. We do a physical exam with the dreaded rectal exam that nobody really likes to check for the size of the prostate and to check for any nodules there. We check the urine. We do a blood test for the PSA for prostate cancer screening, but also the PSA gives us an idea about the size of the prostate. We give that questionnaire that I just showed you. That funny looking toilet here is a toilet where a man urinates through it and it calculates the flow of the urine. It's able to tell us how strong the urinary flow is going through and that will give us an idea about whether there is an obstruction. After the man urinates, we have them go and lay down in the bed and we do an ultrasound of the bladder to see whether the bladder is emptied and we call this a Euroflow PVR. And when we really want to know what's going on or we want to proceed with any kind of procedures or surgery, we do a cystoscopy, which is like any kind of endoscopy from the top or a colonoscopy. It's a very small tube that we pass through the penis into the urethra and then into the, through the prostate and into the bladder. And we're able to look at the anatomy and figure out exactly what's going on. So what are the treatment options for BPH? For those who don't have very significant symptoms, we, we put them on watchful waiting and we do uh, lifestyle recommendations. So for example, if I have a man who comes to see me, he urinates okay, but wakes up at night five to six times to pee, and he tells me he's having three glasses of wine and a coffee and two glasses of water before going to bed, I'll say, well, maybe we'll have to work on what you're drinking before we put you on medication. But often these things don't work, unfortunately, and we have to go to medications. The medications are great. They've been around for a long time and we have a lot of options, but they they do carry some sexual side effects and they can drop the blood pressure so there are some side effects to the medications. Historically, when the medication didn't work, we went straight to surgery. Over the past five to six years, we have some really nice new procedures that we can do in the office, like I mentioned, and I'll show you a couple of pictures. And so we have new options for men who don't really want something that's too invasive, but also want to have their, their prostate treated with something a little bit better than medication. So when we look at surgery, this is the TERP, also known as the rooter router. Basically what we do is we go in with a scope or a camera through the tip of the penis. This is the prostate, as you can see it's enlarged. And using this loop, we're gonna just basically shave the prostate off to open up the passageway of the urine. This funny looking picture here with this, this light is the green light laser. It's another way of doing the pro procedure. What we're doing basically, we're just creating a big channel and we're decreasing the resistance of the urine. It works nicely. It's the gold standard for an enlarged prostate. And for most men, it will correct the problem. The main side effect that has men not wanting to do the surgery is afterwards, they end up with something called retrograde ejaculation, which basically when they're having sex, they're able to reach an orgasm, but the ejaculate doesn't come to the outside. It goes backwards into the bladder because the connection between the prostate and the bladder here is lost. As you can see how open this is. So the ejaculate goes back into the bladder instead of coming forward. 
For a lot of men, that's not an issue, but more and more men are sexually active later and, old, and at older age, and so that becomes a little bit of an issue, so men tend to shy away from this kind of procedure. So that brings us to the in-office procedures. This is Eurolift, has one of the best marketable names of any procedure in the world, so basically what it is, same thing, we go in with a camera, and what we're doing is we're just putting these little staples here that are gonna open the prostate open. As you can see here, the prostate is closed, those staples are gonna open up the prostate. This is an example of a prostate where the lobes of the prostate are completely obstructing the urine flow, and this is after the staples are placed and there's a nice big channel for the urine to come out. This is an outpatient procedure. It takes about three minutes to do. We do it under local anesthesia in the office. I do it between patients, and the patient gets up and goes home without a catheter, and they can be able to urinate. It provides about a 60% improvement in urination compared to baseline. It's not as good as surgery, but it's certainly an option for men who don't want to go ahead with surgery. Also, it preserves ejaculation, which is in men who care about that, something that's really great. The resume procedure is another procedure that's a little bit different. As you can see here on the large, large prostate, this is the machine with a little uh, uh, the handheld uh, scope. At the end of it, there's a little needle that you can see here. The needle will go into the prostate and the, it's gonna deliver, deliver steam. It's really hot steam into the prostate. The steam over time is gonna shrink the prostate and over time, this is gonna happen. There's gonna be a nice big opening for the urethra for the urine to come out. That works also very nicely. The outcomes are very similar to the Urolift and also about 60% to 70% improvement in urination. Also, it's an outpatient procedure. The only difference is this one requires a catheter for a few days after, after the procedure, but it's also equally outpatient. Patient comes in, goes home afterwards. So we're gonna to touch a little bit about low testosterone, which is probably what I see the most in, in, in the clinic. I have a lot of patients here who, who in, in Newport who see me for low testosterone. So what is low testosterone? It's also known as hypogonadism. So if you can see here from this editorial on time, it's all been, it's been called the menopause or andropause, and they're correlated it to menopause as testosterone decreases. So testosterone or free testosterone decreases as men age, and there's two reasons why it does. Either the testes are not working well enough that they're not able to produce testosterone, or the brain is not able to send enough signal down to the testicles to produce testosterone. Either way, the treatment would be with testosterone replacement, and we diagnose this with a blood test for the testosterone. We have to do the blood test in the morning between 8 and 11 a.m. because testosterone follows a circadian rhythm. It means it's highest in the morning and it tends to taper down during the day. So how do you know if someone has low testosterone? So some of the symptoms are decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, uh, decreased beard and, and body hair, decreased muscle mass, loss of bone mass, mental emotional changes, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, hot flashes, also sometimes some sleep disturbances can be related to low testosterone. So we check it by doing a blood test for testosterone. Now testosterone is a generic term that encompasses multiple different varieties of testosterone. So there's total testosterone, which is all the testosterone that is in the body. And that's divided into free testosterone and testosterone that is bound. Now the free testosterone is what the body can use. The bound testosterone, we can't use it. So if we look at the distribution of testosterone, this is a young adult. And this part here in green is the only part of the testosterone that is free. Now, when you combine this with the, this part, which is the SHBG, sorry, this one, the albigen, albumin, and this one, the CGHBHD uh, testosterone, these are called the bioavailable testosterone. So this is what we can actually use. This part here is testosterone that is bound and we cannot use it. Now, as you look here at the elderly population, you can see that the proportion of testosterone that is actually used becomes significantly smaller. So the testosterone level might not necessarily be lower as men get older, but the percentage of the testosterone that the body can use becomes lower. So just looking at a total testosterone number or cutoff doesn't necessarily give us all the information we need. That's why sometimes advanced testing is required. So when we look at hypogonadism, or the definition of low testosterone with symptoms, you can see that it increases as men get older, but the total testosterone value might not necessarily reflect it, but the free testosterone will be lower. We know also now that hypogonadism or low testosterone is associated with all the elements of the metabolic syndrome. That includes obesity, hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, and insulin resistance. And all of these are associated with damage to the vessels, and that eventually can lead to heart disease. Why is that? 
There is obesity is on the rise in the United States, but also um, the, we know that diabetes is on the rise. So as you can imagine, testosterone or low testosterone or hypogonadism is also on the rise. One of the reasons, if you look at a diet from the 1950s and you compare it to a diet today and in a fast food restaurant, you can see that the amount of proportions that we eat are getting bigger. So people are getting a little bit overweight, that more diabetic and pre-diabetic and testosterone is getting lower. The studies show that the, the, the higher the weight, the lower the testosterone. When men lose weight, their testosterone actually goes up. And the other way is true as well. We also know that if you take a bunch of diabetic men and you give them testosterone replacement therapy, if they started with low testosterone, this is men who are low testosterone and untreated, and this is survival, and they're all diabetic. If you give them testosterone, you can see that their survival matches those who have normal testosterone. So there are benefits to testosterone replacements beyond sexual function. What are the myths about testosterone replacement? It does not cause cardiovascular disease if it's done in a safe and monitored fashion. It does not cause prostate cancer. Testosterone is not necessarily fuel for the prostate as, it's, as we've been led to believe since the 1940s. And testosterone is not meant for bodybuilding purposes. What I tell my patients all the time, if your thyroid hormone is low, nobody asks any question. Everybody goes and corrects it. People don't do it for testosterone because there is abuse of testosterone. There is an abuse for a thyroid hormone, for example. There are a lot of treatment options for testosterone, patches, gels, injections, pellets, and we have a new auto injector for testosterone now in the market that is painless. So there are different options that we can offer patients. We're going to move quickly to ejaculatory dysfunction. I won't spend a lot of time here, but the average time to ejaculation is about five minutes. The most common sexual dysfunction in men is not ED. It's actually premature ejaculation and occurs in one in three men. And it's usually when men ejaculate within one minute of penetration or they are unable, unable to delay ejaculation beyond the time of completing intercourse. Uh, delayed ejaculation is when a man it takes him a very, very long time to reach an ejaculate. And anorgasmia is when someone is in, in, unable to reach an orgasm. Orgasm and ejaculation are different. Orgasm means finishing an act and being happy and satisfied. Ejaculation means something coming out at the end. So for premature ejaculation, the best option is usually behavioral therapy. Uh, other options include topical anesthetics that can be applied on the penis. Antidepressants work very well as well, very low dose antidepressants. Uh, Botox has been attempted with some success, but has mostly been dropped, but might, might be some potential for it in the future. In terms of delayed ejaculation, most commonly it's because the testosterone is low. I won't even touch on the other ones because really 99% of the time the testosterone is low and we correct it and men are able to reach an orgasm at a better rate. Peyronie's disease. This was the hardest one to present without showing some inappropriate pictures. So <laughs> Peyronie's is basically an acquired condition in which the penis over time develops a deformity. So if the penis is curved, it can be up to the side, downwards. It can be dented on one side. It can be dented and look like an hourglass. Sometimes the penis is so curved that it can go back and look at the person. Uh, and you can imagine how troubling it is. And imagine how troubling it is as you know, the men in the room know that you sometimes wake up with an erection and you need to pee at night. Imagine waking up with an erection that's looking back at you and you need to pee at night. So that, that can be quite a, quite a problematic for some men. <laughs> in the beginning, it can cause pain. It can lead to ED. And it's associated with very significant psychological distress. There's reports of suicide because of Peyronie's disease. It really affects men a lot. So how does it happen? A scar, this is a normal penis, and this is the tunica albuginea that covers the corpora, which are the two spaces that fill up with blood in the penis, these two areas. Over time, due to either a traumatic event or repeated trauma to the penis, scarring occurs here in collagen deposits and forms a plaque. As the plaque forms, what it does, it pulls the tissues together, the penis bends, the penis gets shorter, and is not able to expand anymore. And this is what we end up with. Remember, 9% of men have Peyronie's disease. It's much more prevalent than people know. It's just that nobody talks about it. So looking at this room, there might be one person in this room who has Peyronie's disease. We, don't, we won't ask you to identify yourself. <laughs> so treatment options. Stretching device is one option. Just put the penis under attention. It's the same as the concept of braces, just something to straighten the penis. 
Another option are surgical. This top one is the most common surgery. If the penis is bent upwards, we put sutures on the opposite side and we basically tell the penis to come down. We're not touching the plaque that's causing the curvature, we're just training it with sutures. Another option is to cut the plaque out. We don't remove the whole plaque because men invariably end up with ED, but we remove a small piece of the plaque and then there's going to be a little bit of a hole and once the penis strains, we put a piece of graft or a patch over it and that works very nicely in select patients. And finally, injections. So we, the best example, again, difficult to show picture is a banana. So we're going to curve banana. So we're going to inject the medication into the plaque to try to dissolve the plaque. If you remember, I said the plaque and that causes the Peyronie's disease is made of collagen. So that medication that we inject is a bacterial form of collagenase, which is an enzyme that dissolves collagen. The human collagenase is not very good. So instead we use a bacterial version of it that dissolves the plaque. I think I'm running behind a little bit here, so I'm going to just show you a few slides about ED. So most people think that erectile erections in men are just an on-off button, and in women it's much more complicated. The truth is erection in a man is a very complicated process. It requires psychological, neurological, and vascular factors as well as testosterone. If you look at the rates of, testosterone, of erectile dysfunction, one in three men have ED. And as with BPH and low testosterone and Peyronie's disease and most conditions, as men get older, they're more likely to have ED. It's the main question people are always ask me, but are older men sexually active? So I always have men in their 70s who are embarrassed. They say, oh, I still want to have sex, but I'm too old for this. If you look at the statistics in England, between the ages of 80 and 90, 30% of men are sexually active, 70 to 80, 60%. In America, this is from Indiana, 60%, where 40% were still active after the age of 40. So age is just a number. And the truth is, yes, older men are sexually active. And if they need something to, to treat their ED, we should help them out with it. Sex keeps you young. This is a really cool study. 73 participants between the ages of 50 to 83 participated in a study, and they showed that their greater frequency of sexual intercourse was associated with better overall cognitive scores. So for those of you who are sexually active or want to be sexually active and your partners are not, just show them that statistic. Maybe that will convince them to change their mind. So risk factors for erectile dysfunctions are the same as for low testosterone and BPH, smoking, and any kind of uh, unhealthy lifestyles, obesity, and low testosterone. If this is the blood vessel in the heart, okay, the, and if you imagine it narrowing like this with plaque, this is the size of a blood vessel in the heart. The blood vessel in the penis is about this size. So if you're going to block this one, you can imagine that blocking the blood vessel in the penis is going to happen much earlier. And actually, blocking the blood vessel or ED is the earliest sign of potential cardiovascular disease in the future. Treatment options, we have pills. We have vacuum devices, we have injections into the penis, we have suppositories that we can put through the tip of the penis. But for those who are refractory to all these options, we have penile implants that we can put. And this is the inflatable penile implant, and I'll show you a one minute video about it, if the video plays. So. This is the penis. So two cylinders are made of, of silicone are placed in the penis. A balloon of water is placed in the belly and a pump is between, between the testicles. And it's a simple hydraulic system. When a man wants to have an erection, he's gonna press the pump that's between the testicles multiple times and the water is gonna be pushed from the reservoir into the cylinders and the erection is gonna happen. And the erection will stay hard as long as the implant is inflated. So I joke around with my patients that no 18 year old man can compete with you anymore because you can keep the erection for as long as you want. Once you're done, the man's gonna press the deflation button on the pump and squeeze the penis and the water is just gonna go back in the opposite direction. This is an outpatient surgery that takes 45 minutes, has an over 95% success rate with about a 3% complication rate and it provides sexual or restores sexual function to men who have really bad erectile dysfunction and is a great option to have for men who don't respond to pills and injections. Uh, I'm very happy to say that since I've been at UCI, we've become one of the one of the bigger programs in the country for for prosthetic surgery. Like I showed, we give a yearly residence course for residents from UCI, UC San Diego, UCLA, Loma Linda, and Caesar Sinai. This year, it was here at UCI, and it was attended by the highest number of residents in a single uh, uh, training program for prosthetic surgery. 
We also uh, run an international advanced male prosthetic course, which we have doctors, as you can see here, coming from all around the world. You can practice your, your maps here on the top. Uh, come here to learn about prosthetic surgery, and this is the second year we do this program, and it's been incredibly successful, so we're very proud of this endeavor. And in conclusion, I uh, encourage you to come and see us. Uh, Urology has offices in Orange and in Newport. These are the ones where I work, but other offices in Tustin and Loma Linda, and uh, Erica can give you more information about all the other offices. We're also all the way up in Long Beach. Uh, these are the websites for Men's Health, ucimenshealth.com and faisalyafimd.com. These are both the UCI and Men's Health uh, websites. Encourage you to come, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. So it's a real honor to be here today. Um, I'm a research scientist, so most of my content is going to be about my overview of the field as it relates to how sleep is important for our health and cognitive functions. Um, but I did want to bring up, because we had that lovely talk beforehand, that um, you know, one of the th questions I get asked a lot um, when I'm, people ask me about sleep is, if you have to get up and go to the bathroom all the time, is that going to disrupt your sleep enough that you have to worry about dementia? No, that is not going to cause dementia if you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. So don't worry about that. It's more important of how your quality of sleep is, how able you are to fall back asleep again. But I just want to answer that before I got started. So thank you for, um, for inviting me to, to speak in this, this series. It's a real pleasure. To, and I'm ha always happy to engage in the community to talk about sleep. Sleep is something I'm very passionate about, not because I like doing it all the time, though I do. Um, but because I think it's a really fundamental process in our bodies, it's really relevant for many different aspects of our health, and it gets ignored quite many times. Um, but before I talk about sleep and its role in cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease, I, as a scientist, I think it's very important to define your terms. So I want to define sleep for you and talk about sleep and why I think it's important. So many different organisms sleep, right? You can find it in all kinds of different species. There, what here is presented a series of different different examples of different animals or organisms, including humans as well, where we've had research models studying sleep in them. And yes, that includes upside down jellies, that includes worms, that includes Drosophila. Many different kinds of animals sleep and their physiology is fundamentally different. And so really when we think about sleep, we don't think about sleep as a physiological process per se. It's a behavior, right? That has a series of different characteristics that are associated with it. Right? It's a period where you, you're not very active in the environment, right? You, you don't, you're, not, you're less active when you sleep. Um, you have a species specific recumbent posture. You know, we like to lie on our back or on our side, but these cute little rodents like to curl up into a little ball, right? Uh, jellies like to sit on top of a rock and just kind of slow down and just kind of chill out, you know? Um, it's also um, associated with the reduced responsiveness to the environment. So if any of you have ever raised a teenager, you may have noticed that they have this period of sleep where you could swear they can sleep through an earthquake, right? Um, that's a really good example of this reduced response to the environment. It takes louder noises, brighter lights, or in some unfortunate early experiments in the 1800s, more painful, shocking stimuli uh, to wake somebody up. And uh, so it's, it's a very intense period where we're really unplugged from the world, right? And this is true in all of these different species, including flies. Uh, the other thing is it's rapidly reversible. So we don't go into comas when we go to sleep at night, right? We go down, we rest, and then we wake up and we go about our day the next day. So all of these are fundamentally important features. And one of the other most fundamentally important parts of this is it's actually deprivation is followed by rebound. That means that in part, sleep is regulated homeostatically. In other words, kind of like hunger, right? So if you go for a long period of time without food, you get hungry, you need to eat. Right? And then when you eat, you feel sated and you're not hungry anymore. Right? Sleep is the same way. If you go a long time without it, you get really, really tired. You get hungry for sleep. Right? And then when you sleep, it's restorative. And in fact, if you take someone and you deprive them for sleep for a very long period of time, their sleep following that will be extremely intense. Right? They'll be able to sleep through an even more big earthquake or you know, a, a, a louder plane taking off or some other in, incredible stimuli. Uh, so th these are all important behavioral features that are true in all these different organisms, okay? Now, to do this, sleep has had to overcome many different evolutionary boundaries and barriers. One of the examples here is just an ex is a demonstration of this. Mammals, aquatic mammals sleep too. Wh dolphins sleep, whales sleep, right? 
they still have to breathe every few minutes. So they had to overcome that challenge to be able to sleep for a long period of time while still having to breathe every few minutes. So how did they solve it? They sleep one hemisphere of the brain at a time, right? So they overcame this tremendous challenge by, by coming up with a, a creative solution. And because it is, you know, evolution or whatever biological process you believe in has created all these challenges here, um, it's actually viewed now as one of the great sleep researchers of our time, Alan Richthofen, who actually was part of creating the rules for how we stage sleep, he once had a really lovely quote that really summed this up, right? If sleep doesn't serve some vital function, it is the biggest mistake evolution has ever made, right? It is fundamentally throughout life. And it's made this mistake over and over again through many different species that have many different kind of branches, right? So there's something fundamental about it. And I'm going to talk just a tiny sliver of that tonight, talking about its relationship with brain health and cognition and dementia. Um, but again, first, before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about what, what sleep is and how we define sleep in humans. So sleep is not a unitary process. There's multiple types of forms of sleep, right? So we have two main types, non-rapid eye movement sleep and rapid eye movement sleep. Very cleverly named, right? There's, there's a REM and there's a not REM, right? Well, the not REM sleep has a series of different stages where you transition um, from lighter stages of sleep, the stuff that's in the first few minutes when you're falling asleep, to more stable states of unconsciousness, and ultimately to the deepest form of sleep, which is slow wave sleep. And it's called slow wave sleep because of the brain waves that occur during that sleep, and I'll show you an example of that in the next slide. Okay, so the deeper sleep is, um, this is the, takes the loudest noises, the brightest lights to wake you up from. Okay. The other stage of sleep is rapid eye movement sleep. And this is um, a sleep that's been mostly associated with dreams, though you can dream in any stage. REM sleep is the state where you have the more active, vibrant, bizarre dreams with emotional narratives that are salient and go from one thing to the next to the next, right? So this is where most of those kind of dreams occur in, okay? Um, but this stage of sleep is also associated with a brain state that's a lot like a wakefulness. And matter of fact, the earlier studies, people just thought that was wake because they weren't watching their eyes, they weren't watching that they were asleep, they just kind of put them in a room and measured their brain waves. But the other important feature of REM is skeletal muscles in large part are atonic, which means they're suppressed, they're inhibited. And this is fundamentally important. If you dream that you're running through a field, your motor cortex that controls your legs are sending those signals to your legs to run. Why don't you run? A tiny part of your brainstem says to the spinal cord, stop that. Do any of you have pets? Yeah. Have you ever watched your pet sleep and they'll twitch a little bit? That's exactly what's happening. Okay, so I'm going to show you an example now of what happens when that inhibition breaks down. And I'm going to do it by showing you a cute video of a dog, much as what you could find on YouTube. So this dog here is sleeping, right? He's obviously sleeping. He's in his recumbent posture and he's resting and relaxing. You'll start to notice a little bit of twitching in his legs, right? As he starts up, oh, see there is. Oh, he's thinking about running, right? He's chasing something down. But unfortunately, this dog does not inhibit his movements. He actually runs in his sleep because he does not have that control. This is an animal example of something called REM behavior disorder, which is a disorder where you lose the inhibition to, to uh, control your movements, right? And this dog woke himself up for doing that. Oh, oh, you haven't seen anything yet. All right, so watch this. He goes back again. And it's like, he's, oh, he's working up to it. This is going to be exciting. So he really wants to chase something down. Obviously, in his dream, it's probably something very tasty or something very cool and sounding. Maybe it's a little squirrel or something like that. Dogs love squirrels. Um, but anyway, at some point, you're going to see him sprint as fast as he can sprint, but he's asleep. And that's going to be any moment now, any moment now. I'm always, hard, you know, there we go. So this is why we inhibit our movements in our sleep. So we don't do that, right? Um, and in a matter of fact, humans can have these types of disorders, okay? They can have something called REM behavior disorder. And this is, you know, as funny as this is in this sort of animal video, for humans it can be quite tragic for a number of reasons. One is that they can hurt themselves or even sometimes their partners while they sleep. There have even been court cases about people accidentally killing their partners at night. It's very tragic. A lot of times what's terrible about that um, in the cases where it's actually REM behavior disorder and not just a defense. Um, the one thing that's terrible about that is a lot of times they're dreaming about protecting their partner from a threat, right? So it's very sad. Um, the other side of it is that REM behavior disorder is actually highly predictive of people 
developing Parkinson's disease because it involves some of the same physiology. So it's a very tragic disease. It's not that common. Um, and it's very different. I just want to clarify. It's very different from sleepwalking and, you know, urinating in your sleep or talking in your sleep. That's all non-REM sleep related. That's not REM sleep related. So if it's specifically acting out your dreams or is, is more REM sleep related. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, is this, is this um, related to a disruption in the brainstem where the brainstem lacks inhibitory function? Oftentimes, yes, it's associated with degeneration of those centers, or in some rare cases, you can have a lesion associated with some other event, but it's usually sort of degeneration of something in the brainstem that's related to actually the cholinergic system in the brain, because the cholinergic system controls that. So that's a great question. Okay, so anyway, this is sort of the breakdown of stages and the types of sleep. Um, but sleep is not going from one state to the other and then you wake up. There's a very specific architecture. And I'm going to show you an example of that by showing you what we call in the field a hypnogram, which is a graph of sleep, right? So this is the time across the night, and these are the different sleep stages. What you're going to see is the wake is going to be on top, and then REM sleep is going to be in little red bars here, and then everything else is non-REM sleep in blue lines, okay? So you'll see as it follows a very characteristic pattern across the night. Right, where you start in, you're awake, and you fall into lighter stages of non-REM sleep, then another non-REM sleep, then a deepest non-REM sleep, slow-wave sleep here. Then you'll go up into REM. And this, some of you may have heard about this, the sleep cycles. We sleep in these 90 to 120 minute sleep cycles, right? Um, and that's true, and that's what these are, um, but there's something fundamental about it that I think is important. One is that the content varies quite a bit throughout the night in what's in each of those cycles. So the first cycles really are dominated by your deep slow wave sleep. Whereas later stages you have more REM sleep, you have more stage two sleep, and all of these have different physiologies associated with them, which I'll show you in the next slide. Okay, so they repeat throughout the night in these cycles, but the other important thing is their duration and their content is very variable. So you can't really time your own sleep by, oh, I need to catch a whole cycle, so I'm gonna sleep for 90 minutes. Your cycle might not be 90 minutes in that moment. It might be in another night, but it might not be right now, right? So it's very variable. The brain basically gets what it needs at the time based on its prior history. So let's just look at some of these brain waves. Um, I'm gonna turn you all into sort of, you know, sort of neuroscientists here for a minute. I'm gonna show you uh, what an EEG trace looks like in different stages of the brain. And essentially the principle is the taller the waves, it means more neurons are essentially firing together in time. And the, the, the frequency, how, how quickly you see those peaks determines the, the timing of that, right? And typically in a wake state, what you see here is you see that a lot, you see a squiggly line. Essentially a lot of different neurons and little neurons are doing their own thing, right? Because brains are complicated and behavior in, in our environment is complicated and we have a lot of different networks do a lot of different things at the same time, right? So it's not very much synchrony, okay? So you have this lower voltage, lower amplitude waves and it's a little squiggly and it's fast, okay? When you go to sleep, and this is non-REM sleep here, in the lighter stages, it actually looks a lot like what you see here. There's not much of a difference. This is a transition into sleep, so it's still a little bit like wake-like, and you can pop in and out. The only difference is it's this alpha activity here, which is just what looks like kind of a fence in front of the EG that is, is not there when you're asleep. But in stage two sleep, and I want to point out, this is the same amplitude scale and the same time scale. This is what your brain waves can look like. Fundamentally different. You have these really tall waves that are very slow, a lot of neurons are firing together, and then silent, and then firing together, and then silent, okay? So these are called K-complexes, also known as slow waves, based on if there's a number of them together. You also have this bursting pattern, where you have a lot of them firing at rapidly for short periods of time, and then they stop. These are called sleep spindles, okay? These are characteristic features of stage two sleep. Now I'm gonna show you slow wave sleep, the deepest stage of sleep, okay? Fundamentally different than what your brain's doing while it's awake. Very slow frequency, extremely high amplitude, lots of neurons firing together and then silent, firing together and then silent. This is a fundamentally different way of brain operating than when it's awake, right? Then REM sleep looks like wakefulness, right? It looks a lot like wakefulness or stage one non-REM sleep. It's completely different from this slow wave sleep. So it's a different stage of sleep, different type of brain activity, okay? Now, a lot of times in cognitive science, and if you're a sleep researcher, you'll focus on two specific brain waves the sleep spindles and these slow waves, also these as well, because they're similar to slow waves. And that's because they've been associated with cognitive functions. So why do we care about them? We care about them, particularly because of a lot of recent studies in the memory literature that suggests that if you have a group of people and you have them study something, maybe it's declarative facts, maybe they learn a new skill of some kind, 
then you allow them to have sleep. Sleep tends to preferentially benefit your ability to learn that new material so you can recall it better later on as compared to awake control or some other condition. And in fact, there's been a ton of studies, and this is only a small handful of them. It's actually much larger literature than this. This actually, if you actively um, look at the brain waves, it's these slow waves and spindles that are the ones that are really related to that memory benefit. And in fact, there's been a few studies here. Um, any Ghostbuster lovers in the audience? No? Anyway, um, if you um, actively stimulate with different methods like transcranial direct current stimulation or alternating current stimulation or even now acoustic stimulation has nothing to do with passing a current in somebody's head. Um, if, you, if you apply a stimulation to the frequency of these brain waves, you can enhance the brain waves and thus improve memory. So here is an example where word pair recalls improved because they stimulated and enhanced slow waves instead so more intense slow waves. Okay. There's another example here where they did the same thing with spindles and improved motor learning on a motor skill task. The, um, this, the, the last example I showed you with word pair memory was actually done in older adults. So we know this technique can be used in aging as well. Okay. So I've talked about sleep stages. I've talked about different brain waves in sleep. I've kind of made you mini neuroscientists now so you can go out and study sleep. Good for you. I want more friends to do this with. Um, but there's also other clinical um, aspects of sleep that are really fundamentally important, right? And I'm only going to talk about a few examples because they're relevant for the topic. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few example sleep disorders that are fairly common. One is uh, sleep-related breathing disorders. Obstructive sleep apnea is the most common form of this, but there are other forms of sleep apnea or breathing disorders that you can get during sleep. Essentially, uh, OSA is caused by some kind of obstruction, usually in the upper airway, um, it's, it leads to intermittent pauses in breathing. So essentially you're intermittently starving your brain of oxygen over and over and over again. Uh, in addition to that, you're also fragmenting sleep. That sounds like that's less important than the oxygen part, but it's actually pretty important for a number of reasons as well. So you're disrupting sleep and the processes of your brain in a number of ways. It's quantified by a severity of how many of these events that happen per hour. So typically, if you have more than five an hour, you're considered positive, um, though it's not considered moderate until it's more than 15 an hour, right? Um, and then, so there's different ways to quantify that, but you can then look at how many events that happen and how they relate to different cognitive or other aspects. The most common form of treatment is also the most unpopular, which is um, positive airway pressure treatment. Essentially, you put on those masks, they're uncomfortable, but they keep your airway open so you breathe. This has been one of the challenges clinically, ut ut utilization of PAP treatments, whether they're continuous or they're BiPAP or they're AutoPAP, um, have generally low adherence rates. But if you can get it to work for you and you're really good at using it, it can reverse any of the negative consequences that having a disorder can have, and that can be profound. I can reduce cardiovascular risk, stroke risk, and cause cognitive decline risk and go away. So it's really important if you do have this disorder to treat it as much as you can. Another common disorder is insomnia. A lot of us are exposed to chronic stress, or maybe some of us have exposed experiences that may make us predisposed to developing insomnia. Uh, insomnia can be defined in many different ways, but the most common symptoms are inability to fall asleep, stay asleep, or you get up too early and you can't fall back asleep for an adequate duration, okay? So there's different kinds of it. Um, there's many different causes to this. A lot of different people have argued about the theoretical mechanisms of it, but regardless of all of that, despite the fact that it's probably not the most used treatment, the number one treatment now um, as the first line treatment for insomnia um, um, uh, described by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine as their first number one recommendation is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. It's not sleeping pills. It's not sedatives. If you can use cognitive behavioral therapy, that is the best thing you can start with. Okay. Okay. So why did I talk about those? I talked about those because they change with age. As a matter of fact, here's an example of moderate or severe apnea, um, 15 events per hour or more, and this is age across the lifespan. The older you get, the more likely you are to get sleep apnea. So more, more and more people get sleep apnea as they get older, okay? The same is true for insomnia. If you look across these different age groups, the older and older you are, the more likely you are to get insomnia. So these are age-related conditions, okay? Um, they're most likely associated with not, you don't necessarily are gonna definitely get it if you get older. Some people never get these sleep disorders when they get older. But they're very common if people have a neurological, psychiatric, or a medical comorbidity. It can also be associated with sleep disturbance. As a matter of fact, many medical conditions, um, most I would argue, have some kind of comorbidity that is a sleep disruption of some kind. They also increase the risk for mortality. So you, you die younger if you have these sleep disorders. 
Um, they also increase your risk for cognitive decline, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Okay. But in treatment helps, and that's really important. So any of this risk that this confers, if you treat it, it largely reduces the risk. Okay. Okay, so in addition to changes in these sleep disorders with age, there's also changes in sleep staging and the sleep quality that you get. So here's time from age five all the way to age 85, and here's the, all of these lines stacked on top of each other, or time in bed, how much time you let yourself sleep. The top line is your sleep latency. Here is wake after sleep onset, which is essentially how much time do you spend awake after you fall asleep. It's a good index of fragmentation in your sleep. Here's REM sleep, which doesn't really change that much in adulthood. And here's slow-wave sleep. We lose about half of it from the ages of 20 to the ages of 75. We lose half of our slow-wave sleep. And it's often replaced with lighter stage non-2 sleep. Okay. So the two big things that change is we have less slow-wave sleep and we have more wake after sleep plans. Our sleep is more fragmented as we get older. Okay. This is even independent of sleep disorders, just healthy older adults. Now, in addition to losing half of our slow sleep, the quality of that slow sleep also decreases. And here I'm showing you a top of plot. So this is the top of the head and there's the ears either side. And each of these little white dots is an electrode where I've recorded sleep on someone. Okay. And the warmer colors represent the intensity of their slow waves. Okay. And so across older adults, you see most of those slow waves are most intense in the front of the cortex. So see with the frontal, frontal lobe. Young adults are plotted on the same scale as older adults. Similar topography but older adults have much lower levels of intensity of their slow waves. So their slow waves are less intense as they get older. And you can plot that by just averaging across the scalp and you see young adults in red, older adults in blue, there's a big drop in the intensity of their slow wave sleep. So in addition to these slow waves, um, the spindles that I told you about earlier that are also relevant for memory also change with age. Uh, and what I'm gonna show you is a series of these topple plots again, and only gonna just look at the difference where the blue means a bigger reduction as you're older. And you see essentially that there's a loss of spindles, particularly over the frontal derivations of the head that get progressively larger as the night progresses. But the other part of it is you don't lose spindles everywhere. You only lose spindles some places, particularly over the frontal cortex, right? So this means that it's so something associated with the frontal cortex. And actually the frontal cortex is the thing that atrophies the most as we get older. So it, and, and some of the research has now suggested that these are related to each other. The more that your brain and the frontal cortex changes, the more your sleep is disrupted as well. And this is just to show you an example of that, the density of spindles, young and red, older and blue, across the night, what you see is, while well, young adults have a stable or maybe even increased spindles later in the night, older adults have fewer and fewer spindles as the night progresses, okay? So are there consequences of this, right? This is something that I've been telling, talking to you about is sort of the theoretical idea. And what I, th I hopefully have, um, um, gotten across to you is, of course, something you already know, which is that the brain changes as we get older, right? There's atrophy in certain parts, there's changes in how the brain functions within different networks, sometimes pathology starts to deposit in the brain. But I hopefully I've also convinced you there's changes in sleep, and those that sleep changes are related to sleep disorders, related to sleep stages, they're also related to the brain waves in your sleep that are important for cognition. And then, of course, there's cognitive changes, right? It's harder to remember things when we were younger, it's harder to learn new skills, than when we were younger, right? And one of the fundamental questions that we're after, that our group is after in the field is, are they related to each other, right? And so we have some evidence that may be the case. I'm gonna show you a few examples now. One example is um, here is memory retention. So they learned a bunch of uh, word pairs and essentially how able they were to remember it over a night. And these are young adults in red and older adults in blue. And this is the intensity of their slow waves. The more intense slow waves are over here, less intense over here, more memory of forgetting overnight here, less memory of forgetting up here. Okay, so a positive association means the, essentially the higher the intensity of your slow waves, the better your memory was. And it was, didn't matter if you were young or old, right? If you were an older person who had pretty intense slow waves, your memory was pretty good. It was like some younger adults, right? So this, this suggested that, that those changes to sleep actually mattered. Um, here's another example though that the structure of the brain can impact if those brain waves have a benefit to memory. So if you have too much degeneration in your white matter, then the benefit of these spindles here is lessened. So basically you need an intact brain to express these brain waves to get good cognition, okay? But what about abnormal aging? And I'll sort of try to end the talk on that. Okay, so right here is a picture of a healthy brain and a brain with Alzheimer's disease. But I don't have to tell you which is which, do I? It's pretty obvious. This is because Alzheimer's disease, which is an example of dementia, so dementia is an umbrella term and Alzheimer's disease is one specific kind, well, it turns out that neurodegeneration is related to cognitive symptoms associated with that. But there are pathologies that trigger that neurodegeneration. 
And that's these two pathologies in Alzheimer's disease here, beta amyloid plaques, which you see these little clumps of these beta amyloid peptides, and neurofibrillary tangles, which essentially trigger neurodegeneration by disrupting the white matter tracts in the brain. Okay. So they're present decades before the onset of the disease, so 10 to 20 years before they start to build up in the brain. Okay. But why are we talking about sleep? Or why are we talking about this when we're talking about sleep? Well, it turns out actually different sleep disturbances, whether they're sleep disorders uh, or whether they're just generalized sleep disturbance, sleeping too little or having poor quality sleep, increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease across the board. And some different disturbances increase your risk for all kinds of dementia. Sleep apnea, for example, increases your risk for vascular dementia and all-cause dementia, generally speaking. Uh, so because we have these different profiles um, based on the different sleep disturbance you have, suggests there might be different mechanisms that are related to different uh, linking some sleep disorders to different forms of dementia. So there might be different mechanisms at play, but the more important part is that all of them are increasing your risk for dementia. And how are they doing that? That's the fundamental question. So I'm gonna show you a few quick examples. Um, this is an example of a rodent study where they looked at amyloid in the brain Here's across three days of light-dark cycles, and they're nocturnal, so they're gonna sleep more during the uh, light phase and be active more in the dark phase. And here's the amount of time they spend awake. And you can see it follows a circadian rhythm. Those amyloid proteins that make up the amyloid plaques that are one of the features of Alzheimer's disease are in these rodents, and they're cycling up and down, up and down, up and down through day and night. They're higher when they're active, and they're lower during sleep. This is also true in the CSF in humans as well, actually. Um, this is the same study demonstrated that. Then they took these rodents and they chronically sleep deprived them. And the white bars are gonna be sleep deprived and the black bars are, are gonna be um, the controls. And this is a bunch of different brain regions and this is the, how many plaques in the brain essentially. This is the hippocampus, different parts of the cortex. And you see across the board, generally speaking, if you chronically sleep deprived these animals, they had more plaques in their brain. Okay, so sleep was actively increasing amyloid in the, or sleep disruption deprivation was actually increasing amyloid in the brain. But there's another side of this story. There's a part of sleep where a certain process called the lymphatic system gets activated. And essentially what that does, some of you may have heard of it, talked about in the news, it's essentially the brain's way to clear waste out of itself. Essentially what happens is the interstitial fluid between the cells increases because those glial cells shrink in size and then smooth muscle cells flush for around arteries, flush CSF through that space towards veins to help drain out all the toxins, to power wash the brain and clean it up. Okay? Well, it turns out that's much more active during sleep, particularly slow wave sleep. And in fact, that's related to increased amyloid clearance. So sleep is associated with um, decreasing amyloid, whereas more wakefulness or disrupted sleep will increase that amyloid. So it's a bi-directional relationship, okay? There was a recent study by the same group that suggested the same is true for tau. And just to walk through it here, essentially in the uh, controls in white, you see that when they're sleeping, it's not very high, but then it goes up at night when they're awake. If you sleep deprive them in this bar, in these little blue dots, it goes up when they're normally asleep. Then it goes back down when they sleep again, and then when they wake up again, it goes up. And if you suppress neural activity, nothing happens. So this suggests that the increase of amyloid, the increase of tau, um, is associated with how active those neurons are. And they're less metabolically active during sleep, and so that's one of the benefits. So it follows that cycle, it's increased by sleep deprivation, just like amyloid is. And another thing they tried to study is, well, what if we look at how tau spreads through the brain? There's a new view about Alzheimer's disease that suggests that the amyloid and tau proteins move through the brain like a prion disease. It's very tragic and it's very terrible. Um, and they wanted to see if in these rodents, if chronically sleep deprived them would increase how they spread through the brain. And in fact, that's what they found. If you chronically sleep deprived these rodents, if you see the protein in a part of the brain called the hippocampus, it spreads to another part of the brain called the locus ceruleus, both of which increase tau pathology. So this suggests that sleep is also spread, facilitating the, the spread of tau through the brain. So sleep is fundamentally important and it interacts with the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. But in, even independent of that, there are also indirect pathways of how it relates to it. So sleep disorders, such as sleep apnea and insomnia, can increase the risk for um, other comorbidities that are increasing the risk for dementia. So sleep apnea can increase your risk for type two diabetes or metabolic disease, and that can increase your risk for dementia. Insomnia can also increase your risk for depression, and that can increase your risk for dementia. So there's direct paths and relationships with the pathology, but there's also relationships 
with other medical comorbidities that also affect the risk as well. So there's direct and indirect paths. And why this is important is if you treat all of these diseases together, that'll improve your chances to reduce your risk the most. Okay. So finally, even if you look outside of dementia, if you look at how the pathology deposits in the brain, in healthy older adults, sometimes you see this pathology depositing, and it actually relates to sleep disruption. And we found this in a couple of different studies. We found that the, the more amyloid in the brain, the less intense their slow waves were. And in fact, we've replicated that finding recently in another independent group of subjects, so we think it's pretty robust. And that's also related to memory, because the more intense their slow waves are, the better their memory tends to be, which is what you see here. Okay. So it's associated with disruptions in sleep and sleep-related memory, even before dementia shows up. So all of these are related in many different ways. So I've scared you, hopefully not too much. But so what can we do about it, right? So there's a lot of different things that like, we can do to be healthy and approach our sleep in the best way. Um, so these are general sleep hygiene tips that we can follow. One thing that's really fundamental is to make sure that you have a regular sleep schedule all through the day. So you go to bed at the same time, you get up at the same time every day. So your body's clock learns this is the time to sleep, this is the time to be awake. And you want to make sure that includes an adequate duration of sleep, so you're sleeping enough to be rested. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine recommends about seven to nine hours a night for adults, and if you're over 65, about six and a half to eight and a half hours is what's recommended. Um, this gets again to that debate, the wonderful question you asked earlier. Um, bedroom should be comfortable, shouldn't be too light. It shouldn't be too warm or too cold. Usually a cool bedroom is, is good. Um, it's, you know, make sure you have a calming routine. Don't watch an angry political pundit on TV before you go to bed or argue about work or, or think about stressful events. Make sure you do something for fun that unplugs you from all the stresses. Um, make sure to limit light exposure. Some of you may have noticed all these are in white and have this one in blue. Why did I put it in blue? Because it's the green blue light specifically you want to limit at night. Because there are cells in the eye that respond to that green blue light and they're less sensitive to red light. So if you change the light exposure from screens, from um, TVs, from iPhones and iPads and all of that stuff, um, there, are, there are different ways to reduce the green blue light and so you can still use them. But another way to do it is just to straight up avoid them. Maybe listen to a podcast instead, you know, um, or read a book. Reading is good, right? We're here at the library. It's one of the best things you can do for your brain. Avoid stimulants after 3 p.m. Caffeine has been shown to be great for cognition, but don't drink it after 3 p.m. or right before bed. Um, I would also say the same for alcohol. Now, every once in a while, having like a glass of wine with dinner, that's fine. But trying to use it as a nightcap, it's actually not great for your sleep. It'll make your sleep worse. Avoid napping right before bed. Just call that bedtime. Um, some people nap on a regular basis, and that's fine. Just it's usually better sort of at the siesta time, like just after lunch. Um, because if you nap too much and too late, it can actually impact your nighttime sleep. Another thing is to avoid big meals late at, the, late at night. There's now new evidence suggests that if you have the same, one person has um, the same number of their calories as another, but that second person has all of their calories end loaded at the end of the day versus the other one has a bigger lunch or a bigger breakfast, that second person who had it at the end of the day is more likely to get me metabolic disease, gain weight, and have health problems. And more importantly, um, if you have a sleep disorder or a medical disorder in general, seek treatment for that. That's the best thing you can do for modifying your risk. And speaking of sleep disorders, just a little plug for our center. Uh, the sleep center just opened. Um, it's right below. I, I promise I didn't steal these pictures from Dr. Um, Yaffe earlier. Um, these are just the pictures they gave us. But we're on the first floor. They're on the second floor. Uh, just opened. The sleep center just opened in October. It's a very good sleep center. It's run by... And I'm not just saying this because she's my boss. I'm, I believe this before I worked here at UCI. Uh, Ruth Benka is probably one of the best sleep physicians in the world. Okay, so she's trained by the people who made the rules for sleep staging. She's been a lead international leader in sleep medicine um, for many, many years. And she's helped build many sleep labs. And she is just an incredible physician and scientist in the field. And so my argument and my plug for UCI sleep is that you aren't going to get a better sleep physician than her or her people and her team where she's handpicked. So it's very good. It's a new center. It's got hotel quality rooms. So you have a comfortable bed and you have a nice room. It's not like a little hospital environment when you come in for a study. Um, 
you know, she, we have kind of a vision where we're trying to say, what can we learn from sleep to inform on other medical conditions? You don't just go into the sleep lab to just improve your sleep. We want to have sleep be a cornerstone for health, just like diet and exercise and other, and lifelong learning and other things you can do. And so we are trying to understand what can we learn from sleep by using high density EG in our sleep research, because we do our sleep uh, research in the same facility. Right? So it's a very highly interacting team with the researchers and the clinicians. And, you know, of course, if you need help with sleep, we're a great place to come. Um, but also, you know, if people are interested in volunteering for research studies, we, we can't do this kind of thing without people in the community. And that's how we move the needle forward. That's how we make uh, transformational understandings and advancements. So I hope I haven't gone too over. Thank you guys for your time. Happy to take any more questions. One more thing, this is, I guess, the last talk in this series. So if you guys have gone to a bunch of them, congratulate yourself. You've gone through a lot of talks. Hope they were helpful to you. We have a survey that I really hope you'd help fill out to help us out learn how to make these series better. Uh, and if you have any questions for me, you can always email me. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, and I'll take more questions. All right.